Our next topic is fair use. Fair use is an aspect of copyright law that is unique to the United States. And while it's sort of vague, ambiguous, and its interpretations are sometimes contentious, it's also extremely lenient and useful for academia. Fair use is the part of copyright law that actually says that some things are more important than copyright, and therefore, in some cases, what would ordinarily be considered a violation of copyright is permitted. Those things that are considered more important than defending the author's profits and control over their works are scholarship, research, education, news reporting, criticism, and commentary. Because of how copyright works, when you use the fair use exemption, you are using some of the rights that are reserved to the author, and you may be taken to court for it. Fair use is what you call your affirmative defense. Yes, Your Honor, I did that thing, and I'm arguing that I shouldn't be sued or punished for it. This sounds inherently risky, but it's done all the time, and it is necessary for a healthy society and the progress of knowledge. Don't be afraid to use fair use. Just don't stretch it too far. Whether or not what you did was fair use is decided on the basis of what are called the four factors. When deciding whether what you're doing is fair use, you're supposed to decide based on all four of the factors equally. An extremely good case for one of the four factors will not override an extremely bad case for another one of the four factors, and vice versa. In practice, however, you'll see that the first and fourth factors are the most critical and the other two mostly just fit into them. The first factor is the purpose of the use. The purposes that are considered good or favorable are ones that reflect the justification for fair use, that they benefit society and the progress of knowledge through education, research, scholarship, news reporting, criticism, and commentary. Also included and backed up by many court decisions is the right to make a single copy for your own personal use. Commercial purposes are considered extremely unfavorable for fair use. Sadly, art and creativity are not considered especially favorable, but they're not considered unfavorable either. Skipping to the fourth factor, because it's the other really critical factor, is that it's the effect on the market for the original work and also for derivative works. You can see why this is a critical factor. Profits may not technically be the most important thing in the eyes of the law, but they are what motivates authors and publishers to send their lawyers after you. If your use has no effect on the market for the original work or the derivative work, that's favorable. You can diminish your effect on the market by doing things like limiting the audience or making it impossible for your use to serve as a substitute for the original. If your use does somehow impact the market for the original work or its derivatives, that's extremely unfavorable. Now back to the second factor, which is the nature and character of the work being used. It is considered favorable for the second factor to use nonfiction, non-artistic works. Our copyright law assumes that more of the author's creativity and originality goes into fictional, artistic, and dramatic works than into the reporting and analysis of facts and therefore, they have a stronger need for protection. It is not necessarily unfavorable to use a fictional, artistic, or dramatic work, but it won't help your case either. Another aspect of the nature and character of the work being used is whether it was published or unpublished. It is considered favorable to use a published work. Using an unpublished work is not a deal breaker, but it is not favorable. The justification for this is, as I've mentioned, Copyright law is more strict about protecting the rights of authors who did not formally publish their work, because formal publication is usually the avenue through which authors protect their right to be compensated and control the way their works are being used. On to the third factor, which is the amount and substantiality of the portion used. Here, there is no cut and dry amount or percentage. The goal is to use the smallest amount that you can. If you are using a selection of the work that can stand alone, or enough of it that it can stand alone, then it is extremely unfavorable. That points back to the fourth factor, impact on the market for the original work. If you are taking a large part, or the main part, 
or even just a crucial part of the work. It might serve as a market substitution and cut into the sales and licenses of the original. So you don't have to be extremely favorable on all four factors to justify fair use, but you definitely need to avoid being extremely unfavorable on the first or the fourth. There's a famous court case that shows how serious the courts are about the fact that it's not just the amount, but also the substantiality of what's being used. Back in the 1970s, someone wrote a biography of former President Gerald Ford, and there was a pre-publication review of it that quoted a few sentences from it. Normally, a book review is a textbook case of fair use, because it counts as criticism and commentary, and normally, a few sentences of a book-length work is easily justified under fair use. But this time, the author of the biography sued the reviewer for copyright infringement, and the author won. The reason was that those particular sentences that they quoted were the heart and soul of the work. They were the spoiler for the book, and quite possibly the only reason most people would buy a biography of Gerald Ford, because those sentences explained Ford's rationale for pardoning Richard Nixon for Watergate. So as you can see, it's not just how much you use, but also how important it is to the integrity and uniqueness of the work that it's taken from, and how well it can stand alone. Because fair use is so complicated, I've created a tool to help you make the decision whether something you want to do will count as fair use. It's not like the public domain helper that I showed you before, in that it won't actually tell you whether something is fair use. But what it will do is walk you through the process of checking the pluses and minuses of all the four factors. It also serves as documentation of your good faith effort, which is very important if you ever get taken to court in a copyright lawsuit. It's just a Microsoft Word document with checkboxes and spaces to write in your own words. But it does break down the decision-making process into something manageable. So this is a Word document that you download. It's in protected mode. When you switch it to edit, all you can do is fill out the little forms and put checks in the boxes and things like that. I'm just going to run through it really, really quickly, skipping over some parts so you can get an idea of how it works. So as you can see, the point of this isn't that it's an exact science. The point of this is to think it through and also to have documentation that you thought it through. There are some types of fair use that have been established in the federal and supreme courts and therefore count as a sort of shortcut automatic fair use without having to go through the four factors. One of these is a transformative work. We talked about derivative works which are works that are somehow altered from or based upon an original copyrighted work. A transformative work takes that one step further so that it becomes its own original work with its own completely different purpose from the copyrighted work that influenced or contributed to it. A transformative work can't be mistaken for the original, and it can't be used as a substitute for the original. Examples of transformative works in higher education include taking a video or an image and adding a subtitle explanation or a voiceover commentary, or putting thumbnail images into a timeline. Some things that we do commonly in higher education that would definitely not count as transformative works would be translating a work, revising it, or putting it into a new format. Another thing that's very important is that using a song as background music in a video is never counted as a transformative work, probably because it is so easy to strip the mp3 out of the video and use it as a substitute for buying the song. Another form of automatic fair use that takes place in the library all the time is a single copy for personal use. 
It is completely legal to download or print something from a library database or website. It is also completely legal to make photocopies of articles and book chapters from their print version. However, if you are systematically copying huge parts of a work instead of purchasing it, or making multiple copies to hand out to a classroom full of students semester after semester, then it becomes more doubtful whether it's fair use. It is a gray area, and the question is, how systematic is it? And how reasonable would it be in the real world to expect a person or institution to purchase or license it instead? Classroom handouts are something that is done under the fair use exemption. However, they aren't unconditionally protected by fair use. If you find yourself handing out entire articles and book chapters to the students in your course, the same articles and chapters semester after semester, then that counts as systematic copying, which is not covered under fair use. Fair use is more appropriate to use when you are copying excerpts of an article or a chapter, or copying something ad hoc or on the fly for your students to read. Otherwise, it's more appropriate to order a course pack or put the items on reserve or electronic reserves, because those arrangements allow for the licensing of material. For visual resources or something short like a poem, you can put it up on a screen, even read it out loud, because performance and display are much less restricted in a face-to-face -face classroom setting, which is something we will talk about shortly. And if the material is available through your library's online resources, a good solution is to put a permalink to the article or chapter in your online syllabus and require students to bring their own copy to class, which would count as a single copy for personal use. Online students are already used to having to do this for themselves, and face-to-face -face students can adapt. 